Hello everybody and welcome to a brand new Elder Scrolls Online video with me, Sherman. Today guys, we are going to be going over group dynamics and group makeup and what it is to play the role that you choose to play, whether it be a tank, a healer, or a damage dealer. Now, before I get into all that, I do want to go through another character creation because this character we're going to use today is going to be used for making a build while we're discussing group dynamics while we're discussing those different things that come with the with group makeup and why it's important to know what your group has in it so I'm gonna go ahead and make another character for this so we're gonna go ahead and make them I'm gonna do a Khajiit and the reason I'm choosing a Khajiit not not just because it has certain racial passives or anything like that I'm choosing the Khajiit because it race does play a point into your character if you're going for a really min-maxed build. Now, if you're going for a truly min-maxed build, there are some races that do benefit over other races depending on what role you're playing or what you're trying to do with your character. So today, I'm actually just going to make a Khajiit. And we are going to pick, at random, a race or a, a class. So I'm just going to go... We're going to go like that, and then... Uh, I don't know if I... Did I click on the right? I can hear it clicking, so... Alright. I don't know which one I picked, so... Um, but I'm just going to do this, and I'm just going to put in here... <coughs> just going to call it Build Topic. And because your build does play into your role which plays into your group dynamic so when you when you make a character your race can play into your role like I said it can give you some advantages but the advantages it gives you isn't as much as what you get from other sources it's a very small advantage compared to what you get from CP what you get from Undaunted because Undaunted and CP give you to all resources where races give you to only one resource. So that's where races do differ a little. Some some races do give to both Magicka Stamina or Magicka Health or Stamina Health, that kind of thing. But most races, most races only give to one. There is only a select few that give to all of them. Khajiits, though, get no racial benefits, no stat benefits. So they are considered the lowest on the totem pole when it comes to power development. And because of that, it has created a lot of misunderstanding about the game and, and how you can play it. See, a lot of people try to push you into certain races because of the benefits they offer. Instead of allowing people to pick the race they just want to play. Now, Khajiits do get other benefits besides... Um, Besides very like the racial stat bonuses, they get other benefits that that allow them to still be viable in the game. And again, I need to go through and do my my wonderful thing here. And yes, I do use the base interface for this, so I can show people. All right. So here we are on our on our new Khajiit character, and we're gonna cover roles first before we get into group dynamics because roles is what creates a group dynamic. So in every MMO, just about in including old ones like Ultima Online or the new Legends of Aria, where they they are considered sandbox MMOs, Elder Scrolls takes that element of sandbox and mixes it with a theme park type of game. Now, if you don't know the difference between a sandbox game and a theme park game, a theme park game is a game that's set on rails. That means everything in the game is very directional. It, it has a very leading path. Now, Elder Scrolls does have a leading path through the stories and stuff like that because one story leads to another story, to another story, to another story, directing you on a path. So it does have the theme park elements of a role-playing game. It also has a very similar linear progression system to a lot of theme park games. Now, 
sandbox games are open world. That means you, you they're free to, to travel, explore, play in. Even though you're going to run across enemies and stuff in that world that are going to be a lot stronger than you. Just like in Elder Scrolls. Elder Scrolls is a mix of a theme park and a sandbox game. And when it comes to your class, your role, your racial choices, all that, it plays into that. <coughs> so this game gives you all the elements of a sandbox and a theme park at once. So it's more of a sand park. Or a theme box. So you have... Um, that mixture of both now a sandbox game gives you the freedom to play how you want that means it gives you the freedom where if you pick this this character you get to build them how you want them now your class in elder scrolls only represents the skills that you can take advantage of from that particular class so that's where it loses some of that sandbox element like other games have where you can build your character any way you want and use anything you want to do it Games like uh, the new Conan Exiles, it's a sandbox game. Games like Minecraft are a sandbox game. Games like um, Ashes of Creation, which is coming out, is a, is a mix between a sandbox and a theme park. Then you have games like Pantheon coming, about, coming out. That's more of a theme park game because it's going to have level appropriate areas and it's going to guide you on rails through the game based on your level of your character. So, Elder Scrolls, you can go anywhere in the world at any time, at any level, and it doesn't matter. Because all the content is designed to allow you to play in it. So, if I wanted to go, say, here to Gold Coast, I can go here at level 1. If I want to go over here and run to Shadowfin, I can go there at level 1. Like, as soon as I enter the, the game from the tutorial, I can go anywhere in the world because the game scales you to fit the game world all the enemies in the game world all have the same health and defenses and stuff like that every enemy in a dungeon has the same health so on and so forth and the the, the same goes for for trials the thing that separates them all is is it a base game content or is it a dlc content because if it's a base game content everything is the same if it's a dlc content is where it starts scaling uh, differently because based on when that content was released. So going now into the roles, we have three roles in Elder Scrolls. We have tanks, which is right here, it's, it's listed, and it says they absorb damage from enemies and prevent allies from being attacked. That's their job, okay? And that just gives you a base idea of their job. It doesn't give you a descriptive detail on how to play them. We also have this, which is called the Skill Advisor. Now I know I chose a Templar, which is okay. In here, in the Skill Advisor, they do have every role. They have Magicka, Damage Roll. A Warrior, which is a Damage Roll. Stamina Damage Roll. Then you have the Bastion of Light, which is a Tank Roll. And then you have the Beacon of Hope, which is a Magicka Healer Roll. So you have the three roles listed in the, in the Skill Advisor. But the game has a lot more options to what you can and can't use. And we'll get to that a little bit more. But let's go a little bit more over the roles. So you have a tank role. A tank's role is to defend or to keep the enemies off their allies. That means they have to use tools to do that. That means they have to use CCs, which is crowd control. They have to use things like taunt. That's a crowd control ability. They have to use other things to keep the enemies from getting to their allies. They have, the, they have to build their tools around that. And if you look through the game, and I mentioned this in my last video, a lot of skills in this game are broken into different categories. There's damage, control, and support skills. The damage skills are skills that are designed with damage only. Things like puncturing strikes are is a damage ability but it's also got some control in it as well so would this be good for a tank yes it would but is it going to put you in an advantage or a disadvantage in your role now why would this be good for a tank well it has a cc on it see it has that the final strikes reduce the movement speed of the enemy by 70 percent for so many seconds so this allows you to run in on a group of mobs jab them with this ability and then they are going to be slowed. 
that's not going to allow them to get to your allies as easily. So this gives you time to, con learn, to, to control the fight. So this is really good. But it also can be used by a damage dealer, which would be more effective than on a tank. Because a damage dealer can also use control. But they're going to build for that higher damage. And this is where, if you look at each weapon, each weapon has these skills in it. Uppercut is a damage skill with a CC built into it, depending on the morph. This is a damage ability with... Again, a CC built into it. So if I unlock this and I show you what I mean, Stampede, when you use it, it has a reduced movement speed of the enemy by 4%, and it's always a critical strike. But it, it even says the new effect is reduces enemy movement speed. So this allows you to have a control ability there. Now, a lot of people will say this is a PvP skill, and this is a PvP skill, but they're not. These are both PvE skills and PvP skills. So it can be used in either or. It just depends on how you play. Now a lot of the things that, that are misconstrued in this game is that tanks can't do damage. That only DPS do damage. Well, that's false. All people do damage, including healers. It's just that our damage on tanks and healers are not as high as a damage dealer. A damage dealer builds for damage. That's their job. So when you play a damage dealer, everything you do is to build out your damage. That's why when you see a damage dealer, they will have like a max magicka or a max stamina boosted really high. But a tank will have really high health and really low magicka stamina. And they'll also have really low weapon damage, weapon crit, spell crit, that kind of stuff. Because they're not building for damage. They're building to be a tank. Where a... A damage dealer builds for damage, and a healer will build for heals. Now, a he healing in this game is a lot different than other games, and that's because of the, d the group dynamic that's built into this game that you have to understand. See, even though a healer is just like a Magicka DPS, they don't use the same type of sets as Magicka DPS. They use some sets that are similar, or offer the same kind of benefit, like spell damage, maybe some spell crit to give them that advantage to to heal for more because your heals are affected by max magicka and your your max spell damage unless you're playing a stamina healer which only wardens can be then you have to build for weapon damage and weapon crit so you can get the greater heals but you don't want to build too high as a healer because your job isn't to just heal your job is to also support and protect your allies and it's also stated here, that's what they do. They focus on dealing, or they uh, focus on heal and protect allies, keeping them alive throughout the battle. Now, anyone can use damage, control, and support in their build because you can't choose what your skills do for you 100%. It's kind of like when I hear people say, what other skills do a lot of DPS use? If you look at what a lot of DPS use, they use things like Caltrops, which is a CC with damage. So it's got crowd control and it's got damage on it. They use Trap Beast from the Fighters Guild, which is a damage and control and support because it gives them damage. It also stuns the enemy, locking them in place. It doesn't stun them from doing damage. It just locks them and mobilizes them. And it gives you minor force. So it gives you a support thing as well. So it gives you a mix of things. But not only that, but you also get passive support things like Slayer and Banish the Wicked. So these are these passives, you, you got to look at them as, as a mix of, of different types of skills. So you have your active skills, which are these ones up here, which you put on your toolbars. Then you have your passive skills down here. And these passive skills give you benefits. And they're going to be benefits that can boost different things. Or do different things. But they never do anything that offers anything other than increase in damage, increase in character support, or increase in character con like control capabilities. And it improves your capabilities of doing that. Gear sets do the same thing. They can give you the benefit of improving your character 
based on what type of role you're playing. Whether you're playing a support role or healer role, a damage dealer role, or you're playing a tank role. So when you create a tank, it doesn't mean that you're going to take all the skills that you can find to be just a tank. You're going to take on other things too. Like you might take some support skills. You might take some tank skills or control skills. You might take some damage skills. Because even as a tank, you do damage. Every ability you use on your sword and board just about is damage. Puncture is a damage skill. It also has some support on it. Low Slash is a damage control support skill because it does damage, it does control with the movement speed, and it does minor main, which is support. But if you look at even Dual Wield, Flurry, this is a damage skill, and it has some support built into it, depending on the morph. This is a damage skill with both support and uh control built into it depending on the on the morph this is the damage skill with either a morph of more damage or a morph of support blade cloak again damage with support hidden blade damage control support so see each ability has different things even destruction stabs bows you name it every weapon type class skill everything as long as it's an active skill, it will always be built on that. And then, like I said, the passive skills do things to improve either your damage or control or your support. Now, most weapon passives is just going to be to improve your damage. There might be some support in there as well for your character. But it's going to be very minimal. Like this one here gives an 8% damage bonus when attacking, stun, immobilized, disorientated, or silenced enemies. That's a bonus to damage. This right here, Twin Blade and Blunt, gives you bonus to your the weapon type you're using. It gives you different benefits of it. But none of them give you like just you know one thing. They give you a lot of different options in here. And then these give you a lot of different options in how you play. Because each skill has two morphs. So they don't just stay this way. So getting back to the role system. How you put together your group. Depending on the environment that you're facing. Whether it be PvE, overland content. Like a world boss, public dungeon, quests, things like that. There's different things that enemies do. And th stuff like that. That you can use these abilities to do those things like let's say you're doing a public dungeon well you're in there by yourself it's going to be a little bit harder because there's more enemies to face than what you face in a delve then when you go into a normal dungeon it's like going into that public dungeon but it's more difficult but you got to remember public dungeons are open to everyone they're dungeons that are open to not just your four-man group it's all anyone who enters there and everyone will be sharing the same space where in an actual dungeon, it's a linear path dungeon. That means it's a set path that you have to follow to complete it. Same thing with, with trials. Have kind of set paths that you have to follow to complete. And this is what linear games do. They, this is what is called linear progression. So when you enter a dungeon, you, it's a linear progression thing. You have to follow a linear set path to get to the end, to the final boss. But in some cases, there will be off bosses on the side that you don't know about. And a lot of people bypass those bosses because they don't do anything for the progression of the content. So, learn, learn, just learn the, 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 the dungeon as you're going through. Like, right, re, if you have to rerun it a several hundred times to get it mastered, I would do that. But that's just me. But... Again, going back to the roles. So, a tank, a healer, and a damage dealer. How many of these do you need in a group? Well, in most four-man content, you need one tank, two damage dealers, and a healer. And that's if you're starting out. Okay, as you're, as you're progressing your power of your character, you're going to need those kind of things. Now, when you get to higher level stuff, the base game content, 
doesn't quite need those things. And that's because our characters are overpowered for those things. And they're not really overpowered. We just, we become more experienced, more knowledge, and we have more power because of that. So Fungal Grotto all the way down to uh, Vaults of Madness is base game dungeons. Now the base game trials are all the trials in Craglorn. This is Sanctum Ophidium, um, Hellra Citadel, and Ethereum Archive. Those are the base game trials. Now the rest of the game has DLC dungeons and trials that have been added. Everything from Bloodroot Forge down to White Gold Tower are DLC dungeons. DLC trials, <coughs> I have to open the map for, is we have one in Clockwork City. It's called Asylum Sanctorium. We have one in, in Somerset, which is called Cloud Rest. We have one here in the Reaper's March, which is called Maw of Lorcaj. Then we have one in Vardenfell, which is called Halls of Fabrication. Now, there are other mini trials that are made for four-man groups and solo play. So the ones that are made for four-man groups <coughs> are Dragon Star Arena, which I can't show you on here. It's actually right here. And this is the first four-man arena mini trial. That means it only takes four people. And it's not a mini trial. It's actually a really long trial, <laughs> but it's an arena. Then you have inside of Rothgar, or the Arsenium DLC, you have another one up here. It's called the... Maelstrom Arena, and that's a single player arena. Then you have a, another one that was added later into Merkmire, which is called the Arena of Black Rose Prison. So each of these things here, these four man things, are much more challenging than a four man dungeon. But they're only as challenging as the game is, uh, uh, the game's design. So they can be very challenging to new players who are inexperienced and stuff, but to experienced players, they're going to be a little bit less challenging, but they're still going to have a challenge until you play through them and learn them. So in the smaller content, four-man group content, you can do most of those with a tank, two DPS, and a healer. Now, a lot of people are doing a lot of this content, a lot of the older base game content with four DPS, they're doing it with, with a Turnink in 3 DPS, a Healer in 3 DPS. And because they feel they can do that, everyone can, should be able to do that. And it's not true. And they also use that as a way to bypass the Dungeon Finder mechanic. And that's this. Because if you, you can queue with any makeup as any role in, in the Dungeon Finder mechanic. So I can make a DPS and Q as a healer. Or I can make a tank and Q as a healer. And not just a tank. And that's that's one of the things that a lot of people have been doing is they've been queuing as these random things so they can get groups faster. Now, luckily they fixed all this because they used to have it where you could click on all three. But now you can only choose one role to play. And a lot of times if you choose a healer and you're not a healer, you'll get kicked. A lot of times when you choose a tank, and you're not a tank, you're going to get kicked. And a lot of times, even when you pick these roles, if you don't meet certain standards, you will get kicked. This is what is a pickup group. That's what the Dungeon of Finder allows you to do. It allows you to use it as a pickup group thing. So, you don't have to use the Dungeon Finder, just to let you know. If you have a good group of people that you play with all the time, have everyone pick a role and play those roles. But make sure that they enjoy those roles before you guys start playing. Don't just jump into the game and say, oh, well, I want you to be the tank and I want you to be the healer because the person has to enjoy that play style. And that's the way you have to look at the roles of tank, healer, and DPS. Now, group dynamics or group composition, well, group composition is what your group is made up of. And this is what the meta is, okay? The meta isn't just a build type, one build. It is a multitude of builds combined to make one force. So you, you, when you hear people talk about the meta, they're talking about the tank, the, the, the tank, the healer, and the two DPS. 
for dungeons. When they're talking about trial meta, they're talking about the two tanks, the two healers, and the eight DPS. Because in trials, they're 12-man content. That means it takes 12 people to complete. That's two six-man teams. And in most of that, what they'll do is they'll have one tank and one team leading one team, the other tank leading the other team. So you'll have two tanks and two separate teams. Then you'll have two healers and two separate teams. And then you'll have the DPS broken between the two teams. The most ideal setup that a lot of developers create their games for or around is they try to create it for two tanks, four stamina DPS, four magicka DPS, two healers. So that way you can break your groups up into the standard setup. So you have one tank, two stam DPS, two magicka DPS, one healer in each group. So you have a good, rounded group in a trial. Now in a dungeon, the best ideal setup is one tank, one stam DPS, one magicka DPS, one healer. That's the ideal. But it doesn't always fall in that way. A lot of times you'll get into a pug group or pickup group, and you'll get a tank, two magicka DPS, and a healer. Or you'll get a tank, two stam DPS, and a healer. And then there's times where you do get the magicka stamina combination. And it, you'll find that it, the, the group run is a little bit smoother that way. Because you have that Magicka DPS who has AoE and all that. And you have the Stamina DPS who's really single target. And they're just burning down groups really fast. Because they have that really good combination between the two of them. So that's group dynamics. Or group composition. Group dynamics comes down to the build you're playing. And how you play that build. So when you see people say, well, I'm playing this build, and they tell you what build, like I hear a lot of people say, well, I'm playing Alcast build this, or I'm playing uh, Zynode's build of this, or I'm playing such and such build of this, it kind of gives you an idea of what type of build they're playing, but if you don't know the build, you don't know. Now when you hear somebody say, I'm playing a meta tank or a meta healer, that means they're, they're playing that that structure of group dynamic the meta but you have to understand not everyone can be meta from the get-go they have to build into it so it takes time for a lot of people to get from point a to point b to point c to point d and actually it would be more like point a to point f with the meta because you have to play a lot of different content to get to that meta construct of the build because you have to play all environments of the game to get that so it takes a lot longer to get to the meta standard but everything in between is just as good if you know what you're doing so when I hear people ask what kind of tanks can I play well you can play a light armor tank a medium armor tank or a heavy armor tank it's up to you how you build it depends on what gear sets, skills, traits, Mundus stones, enchants, and CP allocation that you use. And this is what makes up a build. So when somebody asked me the other day, well, you say you can make medium armor tanks, but I hear they suck. Okay. Are they impossible to make? No, they're actually quite easy. See, I'm going to I'm going to throw together a medium armor tank right now just to show you. So, to make a medium armor tank, you're going to want stuff that's going to fit that design. So, I'm going to go with heavy armor. And I can do this with with using the meta. So, I'm going to use the exact meta build that a lot of people use for that thing. Now, unfortunately, I have to do something weird here because there is a bug with it. So, I have to wear two heavy pieces. So, this is going to throw off my build a little. But I'm okay with that. So. <clears throat> so the rest of my gear. Everything on my gear. Up top. My helm, my shoulders, my chest, my belt, and my legs are all going to be medium. And I'm going to be wearing too heavy. Because if I use the weapons from Ebon, it's going to throw my character off. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to grab a dungeon medium set. 
Or not the dungeon. I'm going to grab the trial medium set. Here, my bad. And we're going to grab Alkosh. Because that's what a lot of people want a tank to use at in game in the meta. So I'm going to grab the weapons. I'm going to grab the chest, the legs, and the belt. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab two swords. I'm going to grab, just in case, just in case I might need it, I'm going to grab an ice staff, and I'm going to grab the two shields. So I'm going to go ahead and throw this and this and this on the back bar. And then I'm going to grab a monster set. And the monster set I'm going to grab is called Blood Spawn. It's the most common one that a lot of people use. And I'm going to grab this in medium only. Now without CP, you can see I have a lot. Uh, my stats are really bad, all that stuff, and I'm without my skills. So I'm going to go ahead and build this out. And I, I do need to do a lot of the crafting stuff so I can upgrade all the quality of the stuff. Because I can't get it up to gold without. I'm going to grab my provisioning enchants. Yes, I am on PTS for this, guys, if you guys are wondering. That's why I can do this. I am not on live. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this at all. Now, when people say, well, that's not as effective as doing heavy armor, you're right, it probably isn't. But you know what I can do with this? I can still play it. And it is still viable. And what I mean by, there's a difference between being meta-optimal and being meta-viable. This is meta-viable. It's not optimal for the end game, But it is still something you can do. And since I am a, a Templar, it's going to be a little bit different for me <clears throat> to play. I don't need that middle one because I'm not going to be stealthing around. Oops, not that. A lot of people don't take trifocus with this, but I'm just going to because I'm going to use the Magicka for the back bar. So, and I really want to be able to do that kind of thing. So I'm going to do this uh, here. I'm actually going to get rid of that ranged taunt because I have it on the back bar. And now I'm going to go over here. I'm going to do my class passives. Did I do all my destruction staff stuff. Yes, it did. I'm going to go down here and grab something from the Sigic Order line. Oops, I didn't need that one. Don't really need all these, uh, to be honest, but I'm going to take them anyways.
Alright, so now that I got all my skills and everything done like that, as you can see, I have really still really low stats, everything like that. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to buff all this stuff up to its higher quality. And I am going to change out a lot of the enchants on my gear and everything like that. Yes, I do this a lot, so I know what I'm. I know this inside and out. So now that I've done that, as you can see, my stats are still pretty bad. My spell resistance is low. My physical resistance is low. My actual stats are low. But I'm going to go ahead and buff everything else up through my CP. Actually, I'm going to take this down to 31, and this down from there to 66. I'm going to go with my standard setup. For a Templar. All right, so there we are. Stats are done to some degree. We're going to go ahead and get in here. We're going to do the consumables. We're going to grab our food. Pots. Set them up. stats on our gear. Let's see, we are going to do doo -doo 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 enchants. I might have to respect my, my stats, but that's okay. So I want one, two, three, four of these. And I want four of these. Five if I'm using dual shields. So I want this infused. This infused. And then over 
here. I want to do this sturdy. <coughs> and I need to do something else real quick. Oh, wait, I can do one more. And then I got to go in and do that. So give me a sec. I want to change this uh, here to sturdy. So I want to change to infused. I want to change this to sturdy. That to sturdy. <coughs> and this to infused. Go back down. Now, the difference between Reinforced and, and Nurn Home. If you are using medium armor, if you look, Reinforced gives you 2,417 armor on your, your resistances there. If I go down to Nurn Home, I will only go up to 2,385. On big pieces that take you over, that are over 2,000, you always want to use Reinforced. Anything below 2,000, you want to use Nurn Home. So we're going to reinforce the chest... And we're also going to go down here to the shield, and we're going to set the shield with reinforced as well. Now the shield, the reason I did reinforced, is you'll see it does 1995. If I do Nernhone, it's going to go over 2000. But it doesn't give me enough this way to make a huge difference. But just showing you, I'm going to go ahead and do that anyways. But it doesn't make a m much of a difference. But anything you can do to make your character better is going to be good. So we're going to leave it at that, and then I'm going to go in here and do one more thing. I'm going to change my jewelry. Now, the only thing I'm going to change on my jewelry is the necklace. I'm going to change it to an infused, and that's it. So now I'm going to go in, and now I'm going to do my jewelry enchants. I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to find the, the, the uh, shielding ones. As you can see, they're called shield play enchants. Uh, these reduce the cost of bash and block. I'm going to grab two of these. And then I'm going to go down here and I'm going to grab the speed potion one and grab that. Because I'm playing a, something other than an Argonian, I want to be able to use my potions as often as possible. I want to reduce my block cost as much as possible. So there we go. We've got all that done. We've got our stats done and everything else. I am going to go ahead and, and leave it as is. Now, is this a bad option? No, because you can still tank this way. And this tank build, because I am choosing to be a Khajiit, is the lowest of the totem pole. So because I chose to be a Khajiit, I'm going to have lower health, I'm going to have lower max stamina and magicka, and a lot of my other stuff is just going to be in a really bad place. So, why did I build in here, what did I put in a magic recovery, the 49 points? That's because when I'm playing on my back bar, I'm, I'm playing more magicka. And as you can see, I do go to 621, Magic Recovery. But I also have an ability back here called Radiant Aura, which is going to allow me to apply Magic of Steel on multiple enemies. So any enemy that I do damage to within a 28 meter of me, range of me will give me Magic of Steel, not just the mob I'm, t I'm hitting. So this is really good for when you're in a dungeon or something like that. But it also gives me minor fortitude, minor endurance, and minor intellect. So when I do use my tripods, which give me recovery in all three, you can see now I go to 724, 1,125 stam recovery. Being a Khajiit, I get 10% stam recovery. Since I'm in full medium armor, my stamina recovery is going to be better. This is going to make it so when I'm on the back bar, I can block, I can have my buff up, this one. I can block, and as you can see now, I do have 25,000 spell resist with a 22k physical there but when i swap bars i go to 27 24. now i do i am wearing blood spawn so i will get 6k more resistances on my spell and physical i will be at 34,000 spell resist 
35, or, uh, sorry, 32, 33,000 spell resist, and 32 physical resist. So this build is still capable of tanking in game. Now I'm going to go ahead and put the weapon enchants on here, and I'm going to grab two of these. I'm going to grab the crusher enchant, and I'm going to grab an absorb stamina enchant. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the Absorb Stamina on my Sword and Shield. And when I'm on this one, I'm going to enchant this with the Crusher. Because now what I can do is when I'm facing an enemy... Because I don't need a ranged taunt. I have one. It's on my Ice Staff. So I can Ice Staff this guy to ranged taunt him. I can also use Wall of Elements to CC and crowd control him. But I also get that Crusher applied. And as you can see, underneath the enemy up here, when I do my Wall of Elements you'll see that the Crusher is up here on the enemy. And it stays on him. So as long as I have this, this going on him, I can swap bars, block, taunt, and if you watch, when I taunt, I'm going to give it a few seconds, but when I taunt, I get absorbed stamina. So I get a little bit of stamina back. What that allows me to do is it allows me to get back 461 stamina. Well, when I have that going, and I have my class buff going, which buffs my resistances, I get more stamina back. I get 240 every second. So I can have this down, my absorbed stamina, I can block, and I can get stamina back. And as you can see, my resources come back really fast because I have that absorbed stamina. And I have the recovery from the other thing from this buff and then I can also oops I can also do this so when I do this I get magicka back as well so this way I can keep both my magicka and stamina resources coming in it's not a lot but it's 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 enough to help so in reality my character actually has almost a thousand magic recovery. I have over 1500 stamina recovery. And then when you add in the extra recovery I get from absorb stamina, when I use it, my, my stamina recovery and the absorb stamina, if they hit together at the same time, I'm actually getting like 17, 1800 back. It's almost 2k stamina back when I use, when I do that. And I'm not blocking. So this is just one of many tank options I could use. And yes, it is a it is a viable end game build. You can play this in almost all content at end game. You could probably play this in all content if you are comfortable with this build. That means if you are comfortable playing in dungeons, in trials, whatever. And on top of that, you do get a little bit more weapon damage out of it, a little bit more weapon crit out of it. So you do get a little bit more damage. This is more of an off tank setting than it is a main tank, but you still have the tools to main tank if necessary. Because you can use your heavy attack to do that. And anytime you block on the back bar, you're gonna use magic. Where on the front bar, you're gonna use sword and you're gonna use the stamina, so. That's why we try to equal out our magic and stamina with this build. So when you block, it costs magicka. When you block, it costs stamina. And that's what a lot of people do for the meta. Now myself, I don't play this way. I play with something similar, but not to this design. I play something different and that's because the game allows me to and it still works it doesn't have all the funky features this does like the Alkosh debuff or the Ebon Armor b group support buff or this well it does have this but I use a two-handed sword and I use Nightmother's Gaze as my five-piece upper body set and I use Plague Doctors as my jewelry and two of my pieces here my Night Mother's Gaze is this stuff here, plus a two-handed sword, and then I use a bow on the back bar. 
and I don't have as much health because I, I have um, playing two handed is a little bit different than playing sword and board. But are both tanks viable? Yes. Can they both play in game? Yes. Do they work? Yes. Do they do the same things? No. They're not meant to. They're meant to be different. And see, that's what you have to understand. When it comes down to group dynamics, if you are playing meta, you have to play meta. If you are not playing meta, you have to find a group dynamic and a group composition that works for your group. A lot of the times, what meta means is a group dynamic, a group composition. So your, your, the classes that you play, the skills you're using, all that stuff that you use is there to, to work with everyone else's. But you can do that in a multitude of different ways. You don't have to follow some book or some rules guide that states that. Because the game allows for a lot more options than just that. Like a tank can tank in light armor with ice staffs. They are very powerful. A tank can tank in light armor and a lightning staff, or a resto staff, or a destruction staff, any destruction staff. They can even use light armor and sword and shield. You have to look at what the benefits that are offered. Like me using medium armor, is that a bad thing to tank with? Not really. Because see, I'm using two pieces of heavy. So because I'm using the two pieces of heavy, I get this, I get resolve. I get physical and spell resistance equal to 362 for each piece of armor I'm wearing. So I get 724 extra physical and spell resist. I get constitution. I get resources back every four seconds when I'm hit, but I also gain health recovery, which I'm not using. So then I have juggernaut and juggernaut gives me 2% max health for each piece of heavy armor equipped. So I get four piece, 4% 4 max health. Now, when you incorporate things like this down here, the undaunted, I do get 6% max or 4% max health stamina and ma magica, but I get 4% health from heavy armor instead of 2% or 10% for wearing heavy armor. I'm trading off things to make that difference. Then I get 20% from my champion points into health. I get no racial benefits towards health, but this tank is still viable. It doesn't mean it's optimal or the best. It just means it's viable. It's capable of completing or competing at that same standard. It's just not that standard. So it can play at the level of a Ebon Alkosh in an opposite format where Ebon is on the body and Alkosh is on the jewelry and um, the body. And then you have the Alkosh on the, the body and the weapons with the blood spawn head and shoulders and it still works because it's the game's not taking away anything it just it's you're just changing how you play you're changing the parameters of how your character plays this is more of an aggressive tank because you do have a little bit more weapon damage you have you can you can actually play off that a little so you can actually use that absorbed stamina to help you with with damage on the front bar. When you swap to the back bar, you've got this, you've got an AOE spear shards, got that, you've got this. And as you can see, I might've used a lot of Magicka, but I can just heavy attack and I get a decent amount of Magicka back. I get 3,108. But because I'm using medium armor, I also get heavier stamina return on my, on my resources. So when I have my potions going, which I can reuse before the timer runs out. As you can see, the timer's at 32 seconds and it's at 27 on cooldown. So I'll be able to recast it before it comes off. So I can keep my resources coming in at a more effective rate this way. Plus I have Magicka Steel, I have all this other stuff which helps me maintain my build. And if I really need resources, I can just do this and get my resources back. But yes, this is a build that was actually used, was still being used, even the t during the Halls of Fabrication when Morrowind came out, which was over, just over a year and a half ago. Almost, two, We're almost at two years on that mark when Mor Morrowind came out. So people were using this eight updates ago. 
or six updates ago. And some people still use it in this up in this update. Still use this same build. Is it a bad build? No. Is it as effective as the meta? Not quite, but it works. Does it mean it's bad and it you, you can't play this way? No, you can still play this way. It's just the opinion of the person using the build. If this is what you want to use, use it. There's no rules that says you can't. And that's the thing that I mean by, Al by Elder Scrolls having more of a sandbox element. Because the sandbox is there, it's just not being used. So you can play... Can you play a heavy armor Magicka DPS? Yes. Are they as effective as a light armor Magicka DPS? No, but you have do have greater survivability. Is that a bad thing? Not for a new player. Not for a player who's coming in the game trying to learn all the mechanics and everything and is having trouble with it. That might be better for them if they have if they have a hard time playing the game and and dying a lot. That gives them the ability to build to be survivable but still have good DPS. Are they insanely DPS? No. But that's the thing you have to look at. You have to look at the faults of the player. You have to look at the faults of, of your skill level and all that. Can somebody tank in light and medium armor? Yes. Is it going to be more difficult? A little bit. But can it be done? Yes. Is it as effective? Yeah. It's as effective. It's just not as... It doesn't play the same. It doesn't work the same because you have to look at the different passives, the different active skills, the different things that you can use to benefit you based on it. If I was a light armor tank, I could actually take advantage of the spell penetration, the spell crit, and things like that <clears throat> to help me with like heals, maybe, group support stuff. And yes, a tank can do support, but you know who else can do support? A, a DPS can. Do you know who else can do do control, DPS, and healers? A tank is somebody who can who's designed to control the battlefield. A healer is somebody who's designed to heal, and to and protect, and support. A DPS is designed to do damage. It doesn't mean that you're not doing those other things. It doesn't mean that you're not doing damage control and support. You're doing all of it. You just don't realize it. And there's a lot of things you can do to add more group support to your to your team. Like, for example, if you have one DPS in your group run a Crusher enchant on a bow, they can apply Crusher to multiple targets. When people say you can only apply Crusher to one target at a time, that's if you're using it on a sword and shield. If you're using something that has an AoE application, It will eventually apply Crusher to multiple targets. Because that's all I did there, was apply Crusher. But if I want to apply Major Breach and Major Fracture, the same thing. I have to do it on one target at a time with my taunt. To where if somebody was using Night Mother's Gaze, the gear set, they could apply Major Fracture to multiple targets. Because it doesn't apply to one. It applies to any that you do critical damage to. And it's the same thing if, if I was using an Eye Staff <coughs> and I was applying Major Breach. If I use this, this costs nothing. So I can go like this to a group and go one two, three. They all have Major Fracture and Minor Magic of Steel applied to them, and all these enemies are still going to do that, and they're still going to take more damage because of that Major Breach on them. A tank doesn't have to be the only one to apply those things. It's something that the community has created a, a way of doing it to where nobody else has to do it but the tank. But you got to think about it. When you're in a dungeon, are you fighting one enemy at a time? No, you're fighting groups of enemies at a time. In trials, you're fighting groups of enemies at a time. So the tank going around applying crusher and this to like two or three enemies is going to make those enemies die faster while these two stay alive. When a DPS could apply crusher and 
major fracture to multiple targets, and the healer could apply major breach to multiple targets. And that DPS would go, your DPS would skyrocket there because all your DPS is being done greater. And all those trash mobs would die faster than your tank trying to apply major breach, major fracture. See, just because you have the ability, the tank is designed to do damage control support or damage and control, it doesn't mean they can't do support. It doesn't mean they can't do damage control and support. Just like a healer, it doesn't mean that they're not doing damage control and support. It means they're doing a mixture of everything, but their focus is into their role. So like a tank is going to be designed more for doing damage and control, or should be, than they are for support and damage. They should be d designed to do more control. Not just, oh, I'm going to do minor maim on one target, and that's cool. If you have a healer or a DPS run a, a weakening enchant on their back bar, that's weakening on everything. Not, in, not an individual target. So that means all those enemies that are hitting the tank are actually doing less damage. Instead of, oh, I'm going to just boost all my DPS to the, out the roof for my group. Instead of saying, well, I'm going to reduce their the, the enemy's damage that they're doing to keep my group alive. So there's a lot of different ways this game can be played. There is no one specific way that is best. It comes down to your group dynamic that sets that standard. And that's what the meta is. The meta is one group dynamic out of probably hundreds of thousands because you have to take into account every class in the game, every skill combination that you might want to run on those different builds it's kind of like when people ask me, why do you run talons on your healer? It's a, it's, it's a tank skill. It's not a tank skill. It's a control skill with damage. And I actually get greater effect out of it than my tank does. So why not use it? Oh, because it screws up the, the this or this. It doesn't screw up anything. I can still get my resources back. I don't have any issues using it. In fact, I barely have issues using it compared to the tank who's burning through like 4k resources for it or on my mag dk when i play them and people say why are you using talents same reason man to help the group now if you want you can use something else in place of that that could offer you better tanking capabilities besides the the control see this is the thing you have to look at you have to look at how you place your skills what skills each person's using who has what sets? Who has this? How, are, how is this going to benefit the group? How is this going to help us complete this content faster? Now, you got to remember, when you have eight DPS in your group, if you have one that's not running the ideal meta setup, you can have one running like Night Mother's Gaze and Reliquin with their monster set. And they're still going to have a 60-something percent crit chance and that means Night Mother's Gaze, the major fracture, is going to be applied much better than a tank can keep it applied to multiple targets. But the tank can keep Major Breach and Major Fracture up just in case yours comes off because you had to peel away to go take care of some trash or something. So you have that coverage. Or what if you get attacked by a bunch of adds when you're fighting a boss? How are you supposed to kill all those adds? The tank's not going to run around taunting everything when the DPS can apply fracture to everything. What would you what do you find more easy to do? See, that's the thing people don't take into consideration. They look at the game as a one-way street instead of looking at the game with multiple options. And it's not just that. If people say, why do I why do why play a Stam DK? They don't do as much DPS as a Nightblade. Does a Nightblade have the ability to apply major fracture on multiple targets at one time? No. But a knight but a DK does. Well, why am I gonna have a warden in my group? Wardens can do the same thing, but they can also apply major breach and major fracture to multiple targets that are grouped together. That makes the group DPS higher. And if one of them has a Crusher enchant on their weapons, think about it then. 
Now they've got Crusher, Major Breach, and Major Fracture applied to multiple targets because this guy's using an AoE bow ability with Crusher, and that DPS is using weakening on his ice on his his staff to help bring down the damage that those enemies are doing to the tank and to the DPS and everyone else. Then you might have somebody running the Nightmare set that's going to apply Minor Main on multiple targets every time they get hit. So if they get hit by a mob, boom, <laughs> Minor Main on everything. Or you have somebody running an Ice Staff applying Minor Main besides the tank. See, there is a lot of combinations that you can put together in this game to offer all the same benefits that you can get from the meta. It's just how you put it together in your group dynamic. Does it hurt your group if one of your DPS is using an Ice Staff for that capability and they're not using it for the taunt, but just to apply that minor maim off the back bar? No. What does that do for the group? Reduces the damage they take. That creates greater survivability for everyone in the group, not the individual being hit but for everyone in the group who's being hit. Understanding the game's dynamics, understanding the game's mechanics, understanding your skills, your capabilities, your group, what your group's capable of, their skill level, all that stuff plays into your knowledge of the game. And it makes you a better player. So when you hear people say, get good, they're doing that sarcastically and rudely. When I tell people to learn the game and learn the mechanics, that's what I'm meaning. You're going to get good because you're learning the game. You're learning the mechanics of the game. You're learning the dynamics of the game. You're learning how to play the game. And you're utilizing all the tools that are available to you to make the content fun, enjoyable, accessible. And it will not be as difficult as many make it out to be, especially when they, when they count out two things in this game that require a tank to block through. Two. There's only two encounters in this whole game where you really have to hold block all the time. And that's if you're tanking the axes or you're fighting the rock guy or whatever. I think it's an either Ethereum Archive as well or it's Hellra Citadel that has like a rapid strike attack. Do you need to hold block a lot? The rest of the time you don't need to. A tank doesn't have to hold block 100%. That's just one option that they can do. Now I can go into a trial with this same build right here, play through it, and actually survive it because I have that capability to do so because I'm an experienced, knowledgeable player. If I know the content, I can tank any trial with any class in the game. But I might not want to play my Sork the exact same way I play my Templar. Or the same exact way I'm playing my DK. Because it's a different class altogether. It has different benefits. Different passives. So I might want to equip a Lightning Staff on my Sork tank. I might want to equip a, um, you know, do it in light armor. Because I can use my own class shield to give me really defensive capabilities. And that's kind of what I'm getting at. It's it's nothing against, like I said, I'm not here to, de to debate whether the, the meta is good or bad. It's a good thing. But it's not the only thing. It's not the only way. And I want people to understand that. I want people to see that there is more options in this game. Now, just because my tank has lower resistances, people will say, well, you're going you're gonna to have a greater chance of failing as a tank. But the truth of the matter is, I actually have better resistances on this character right now than most tanks have on DKs. When I'm buffed up. And I get my blood spawn and everything to activate. This is DKs mostly most of the time have like 20k physical resist with like a 26, 27k spell resist. So that we're about equal on here, but when it comes to physical, they don't match. 
And it's not a bad thing. It's just everyone has their own preference of play and what they like to do with their build. Now, when I don't have my resistances, yeah, I have to do this a little bit more often to block damage. But I still can take a, a beating with this build because I also get cheaper dodge rolls to avoid damage. I also get more damage when I do my light and heavy attacks because I have 12% more weapon damage from using the light armor or the medium armor. But yeah, that's 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 it guys. I mean, if you are playing with a group of friends and you want a good group dynamic, find it find one group dynamic that works for you guys. The person who wants to play the tank. If you want to play a tank and your group is like okay well let's find you a tank build and all you can keep finding online is is the meta builds don't be afraid to try something new put together something that you like to play and play it learn it learn to be better at it because the more you learn to do something the more experienced you become at playing something the easier it becomes and the easier it becomes the more used to the game you become the more used to the content you become, the more understanding you become of the mechanics, the easier the game becomes. And it's just that way. Because that's the way everything is. The more you learn, the better you are. So, but yeah, that's 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 what Elder Scrolls is all about, guys. Is It's a sandbox game. It's a, a sandbox game element game where it gives you the ability to choose any race class combination and you can play it any way you want whether you want to be a tank a healer or damage dealer you can do that in any way you want but it's best to to yes follow a certain formula if i want to be a magic dps it's better to go with light armor than it is medium or heavy but if i'm having trouble playing as a light armor DPS because I keep dying, maybe playing one as a heavy armor DPS might be a little better so I can get used to playing it. And it will help train me to be a better player. Okay, now that I'm experienced and knowledgeable, I'm going to try playing in light armor now. Oh wow, this is a lot easier. Things are melting and dying faster. And I'm not dying as quick because I have a greater understanding for the game. Use the tools that are given to you to learn and play. Once you get comfortable, play how you want. Play with what you want. If you want to play the meta when you get to max CP or whatever, don't learn just the meta. Learn the game. Learn the mechanics. Learn, learn your character. Learn what skills you have available. And, and utilize them. Utilize them all. Utilize them all to your advantage or your group's advantage. And when your group says, oh, well, you don't have this for your tank, tell them, say, look, I don't have it, but you do. Oh, that's going to lower my DPS. Yes, but is that going to allow us to get through the content easier if we have this? And if they say, yeah, then say, well, what it would be your, your opinion then? For me to change my whole entire build so I have one skill or you grab that skill and make the content easier for all of us. You tell me, which sounds more preferable? To me, it sounds like compensating for what your group is lacking based on an opinion of one person versus, hey, you want me to change everything about my character to benefit you who is asking for this because you think it'll help with our group's speed through the dungeon. Well, why don't you use it? It's not going to hurt you that bad. And honestly, it probably won't lower your DPS by more than a thousand. So. But that's what it is about. That's what a game is about. It's about working together as a team. The meta is just a, a, a team dynamic. And that, that meta isn't the only one. There is hundreds of thousands of, of permanations in there. I think that's what it's how you say it. In this game that you can use in build structure. To create not just one meta, but mo a multitude of metas. 
And that's what ESO is designed to do. It is not designed to create an individual singular meta. It is designed to allow a multitude of metas. And you have to find the one that works best for you as a group. But that's pretty much it, guys, for this video. I hope you guys liked the guides of this week. And I hope it, it helped you understand the game a little bit more and the dynamics and the mechanics of the game and the understanding of the game. I know it was long and spread out. I do plan on making videos here soon on the individual things like gear, skills, races, like racials, uh, racial passives, things like that. But I'm waiting until update 21 for that one. Um, but like classes and their skills and their dynamics to them. And then how you can, co like group composition. I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail in, a, in later videos. I just wanted to kind of give you guys a, just a, an understanding and showing you how you can do all this stuff. So before I get into those more singular um, guides. But yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys like this video, you know what to do. Hit that like button. If you guys want to see more videos by me, you can subscribe. You can also click that notification bell if you want to be notified when I post my videos, because I do post videos, try to, at least, every day. But other than that, I want to thank you all for watching. Until next time, have a wonderful day, and this guy might see you in-game. Bye!